How you guys doing today? It's Anthony Ganji, host of Tear Talk, and guess what, guys? There are people speaking up for corrections. For corrections. Remember, the incident happened in Rikers Island. Officer gets suckered punch, winds up with a fractured spine. Who's speaking up in his defense besides their union? Now we got Eric Adams, president of the Brooklyn Borough. Then we got majority Senate leader John Flanagan. People are speaking up for us. And that's the key. And we're expressing the concerns about making the environment safe for those who protect us. Protect the protectors. The laws that have to be put in place to protect our well-being behind the wall. So when I come back, I want to talk a little bit about why we need these tools to protect us. But I also want to start off with a video that shows Senate Leader uh, John Flanagan, after just speaking to the union... His concerns for those that work behind the wall. So stand by for our sponsors. I wanted to attend a university that had an intelligence program. I wanted to look at problems different. I wanted to increase my critical thinking abilities. AMU offered those avenues to expand. Obtaining your degree as an adult, you're actually paying yourself and investing in yourself. You can't put a dollar on it, it's priceless. It's something that can never be taken away from you. American Military University. Learn from the leader. Being a corrections officer takes its toll on even the strongest individuals. The constant need to perform at the highest level, putting your life at risk in a hostile environment, and the mental scarring of traumatic experiences. 31% of corrections officers show symptoms of PTSD, and 66% of people with PTSD also suffer with a substance abuse problem. The Transformations First Responders Program is specially designed to help veterans and officers heal from the grips of addiction and PTSD in a comfortable, supportive, and serene setting. You are not alone. If you have questions about the services we offer, give us a call at 866-762-8454 to get more information on this affordable and life-changing program. I want to raise a subject that is a little different. <laughs> Last week, I don't know how many of you had meetings like I did, but I had a visit from the corrections officers from the city of New York. Met with their lobbyist, met with their president, Elias Houston fine gentleman, has a very long, distinguished record as a leader of that organization. We talked about issues. We talked about dangers in the workplace. We talked about pension issues and things of that nature. And lo and behold, after his visit, I pick up the paper and see on the news, like many of you, that there was a corrections officer in Rikers who was beaten to a pulp. I mean, beaten to a pulp. He was sucker punched Hello. and beaten up by five members of the Bloods. He, this picture that I have makes me sick. Here's a 39-year-old Haitian man named John Jean Souffron who has served with distinction. And unfortunately, he's gaining notoriety and his name is out there because of a terrific and horrific tragedy. He has a uh, bleed on the brain. He has to wear a neck brace, and he has a broken neck with multiple fractures to go along with it. Here's a guy who was doing his job. Really, even though the inmates are on the inside, he was protecting us for a variety of reasons. So I hearken back to the discussion that I just had with their union. And these folks, men and women, are in harm's way every single day. So when they come up and they talk about disability, and when they come up and talk about their pension, and they come up and talk about workplace environment and safety, we need to listen. Not only do we need to listen, but we need to act. Now, I saw some amendments that came out from the governor, and I think the orientation certainly of our conference is, if I'm going to choose between the bad guys 
and the good guys, I'm going with the good guys. Inmates should be treated humanely. But when people do something like this, there's got to be very, very serious repercussions. Now, I rise to talk about this because I think it's important. I rise because I want to highlight this issue and underscore the fact that these people put themselves in harm's way every day, and everyone should take this the right way, and thank God that they do. And thank God they're as professional as they are. So I would ask that people, to the extent that you can, keep this fine gentleman in your thoughts and prayers. And every now and then, we need a dose of reality and keeping life in perspective. I was getting aggravated this morning because I was not tying my tie properly. And then I thought about this, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm like an idiot. This, it means nothing. This poor gentleman is lying in a bed, immobile, and who knows for how long. So it's unusual for me to do this, but I don't think it's inappropriate. I think it's people uh, should know things like this, and we should uh, honor all of our men and women who serve in law enforcement, because they make our lives safer, better, and happier. Mr. President, thank you. Thank you, Senator Flanagan. Hey, guys, this is great. So you got two people in high-level positions who have the voice but the power to be heard. John Flanagan talking about the dangers of the job and, and Eric Adams, what's he doing? He's urging the Mayor de Blasio, hey, let's get back to that solitary confinement. Let's get back to punitive because we have to protect the protectors. So first off, we have to thank them because they're in the position to make things happen. And we need to make sure that they know that we're appreciative of what they're doing. And I'm not just talking about thanking them on a local level. I mean, hell, national level. You know, let, let them know that, hey, what you guys are doing has the power to change things nationally. And we welcome that. We embrace that. Now, I want to go back to, to Eric Adams and his push for that need for solitary confinement. I hate the term solitary confinement, but it's what people recognize. But guys, solitary confinement is primitive. It's not what it is. It's more of a restrictive housing, uh, an ag seg. Remember, when they're removed, they're still tended to aggressively with programming. There's nobody in the dark. There's nobody forgotten. That's the key. And we're tired of having these extreme cases be the standard definition of our practices. You got to realize something. The, the, the liberal side, the ultra-liberal side, the de Blasio side, if you will, is looking at solitary uh, as punishment. It's not. It's a safety tool. You're looking at it from the wrong perspective. The inmate poses a threat. We have to do something immediately. And trust me, the person will get rehabilitated if they want it. It's another thing. Not everybody wants to change. And we can't force people to change. But what we can do is we can secure them until they're ready to change, if that ever occurs. And when some people say, well, solitary confinement, man, and I hate that word, is not really conducive to rehabilitation. It is. Because when you remove that individual, now you can focus on the other ones who want to rehabilitate. Got to stop focusing on the one. Because while you're focusing on the one, we're focusing on the many, and that there presents the conflict. Now, again... You look at it a punishment perspective. We look at it as a safety tool. So come talk to us. Because every time you say it's punishment, that's when I know that you haven't talked to anybody from the front line. Because front line would easily say, hey, you're wrong. It's a needed tool. It's needed. It helps us maintain order. Plus, the inmate's not forgotten. They're tended to. And again, when you remove the threat, you're able to focus on the many who want to rehabilitate. But again, the other individual is not forgotten. Now, the reason why, again, I say it's not punishment is because sometimes there's stuff that happens in the facility and we need to act immediately. We could worry about the need to rehabilitate later, but right now, I got to do something. We got to do something because this person poses a threat. Secure the individual. Protect the facility and all those that reside within. I would say that the use of these tools, the removal of an inmate from GP, is really done for protective reasons. And therefore, if it falls under protective category, it's a safety tool that needs to be utilized. And obviously, there's no other option here. There isn't. There is not any other option. So stop looking at it as punishment. Look at it as a protective tool. Look at it from our perspective. And I know some people 
who still want to view this as punishment. Uh, but again, punishment because there's an action, right? So if you even want, if you even want to review it as a punishment, it's a reactive measure. Either way, it's reactive. That means we're acting on something. And when you want to say, well, when the inmates get out, they're worse off. What kind of inmates you think are going in? The inmates that are going into those areas are problematic inmates. And if they don't want to rehabilitate and they don't want to take advantage of what we got, you're right. They're not going to be any better. But you can't look at the outcome or what you think is the outcome without looking at what we was brought, what was brought in there to begin with. The more problematic are the ones that are being brought in there. So it may not be so much the environment as so much as the person who's being put into that area. You're putting a lot on the environment and nothing on the individual. And when you put nothing on the individual, you're not taking mark of why they're in there to begin with. Maybe if you remind people of why they're in there and they make no effort along the way to do anything positive, then they're not going to be surprised when we have to release that person, unfortunately. Again, people have to want to change and we'll give them the means to do so. But if you don't want to change, we can't force it. I also want to comment on one more thing. I, I know there's been evidence-based practices that say that punishment doesn't deter behavior. And again, that's all, punishment is subjective. I want you guys to know that because what I could deem punishment may not be considered punishment by somebody else. So again, let, let's take a look at this. Why don't I do something wrong? What is my fear? Well, I don't want to be punished. I don't want to be put in prison. I don't want to be put in jail. So that does stop me from wanting to do something wrong. If I ask most people on the outside, the reason why they don't do something wrong is because they don't want to go to jail. They don't want to go to prison because that's what they interpret as punishment. Now, if you ask that same question, still using prison and jail as punishment or solitary as punishment and saying, hey, would this deter? Well, if you're asking the inmate population who's been conditioned to this life, who's used to that life, they don't see this as punishment. Therefore, for them, it could just be a norm. So maybe they've gotten used to it. They're conditioned to it. And because they become conditioned to it, it may not be enough to deter. So again, it's all about how we view. So I would love to know when you did these tests about punishment and, and deterrence, what population did you ask? Did you ask the average Joe on the streets who would be afraid, who never been to prison before? Or did you ask people that are conditioned to what your perspective of punishment is? Because if that's what you're doing, you're not going to get the right results. But again, you say tomato, I say tomato. You think it's punishment, I think it's safety and security. Because when someone gets arrested, sure, jail and prison could be seen as punishment to the person who gets arrested. But it's seen by the public as we had to put them there for safety and security. I, I think that should carry suit when... We talk about the work behind the prison wall. Someone acts foolish in the prison, same consequence, right? Immediate safety has to take place. The person has to get removed so the jail or the prison can function. So again, it's, it's a needed tool for safety reasons. And it, if you want to put the punishment aspect to it, it's reactionary. So if you're going to say punishment, are we not asking why the person is being punished? Why is there a need to remove that individual? And I think it's just more about information getting out there. So I like the fact that we have people with knowledge who are in positions of power to push, explain to the people, this is what's going on. And this is why we got to help the protectors. Because at the end of the day, we're protecting the public. But who's protecting us? As always, guys, the show's Twitter Talk. Please subscribe, interact, engage, hit that bell. Bell's going to notify you every time I post up a video. My name is Anthony Ganji, and guys, stay safe. Oh.